Amen. So, service, serving the needs of the church and serving outside, but those in need, as they even spoke about, blessing others in places we probably don't know anyone or maybe very few people in places like Ukraine or other places throughout the world. This is not one place. There's many places where, where Christians and people in general are going through hardship. Uh, but how do we serve and coming from, again, a foundation of faith? Not just a social service agency, but because of faith in Christ and what he has done for us, our faith compels us, right? Our faith compels us to, to give, to bless, to serve. Uh, so my question of the day, I'm going to start out with today. Sometimes I weave that into the middle of my message. But what's been your favorite experience in serving others? Can you think about something that just really warmed your heart, where you felt being used. Maybe it was hard. Maybe it was even challenging, and you wondered, why am I here doing this at times? But at the end of the day, oh, this was good, meaningful, and maybe whether you saw it or not, you knew that lives were touched, and uh, possibly even in a, if it was in an evangelistic way, you saw people even coming to faith, coming to faith in, in Christ. Um, one of the things I'll just lead off with is that I've had a privilege to do in the, over the years of my ministry is to lead mission trips. And I've got to tell you, those are some of the most uh, amazing experiences that I've ever had, <laughs> to be with others. Uh, and uh, you can see this next picture here um, is the one that was recently of our youth group. It's been a couple years now, right? But our youth group that went down to the orphanage of, in uh, Baja, California, uh, and serving children, the community, uh, through this ministry just was a great experience. And I hope we can do some more of that, possibly even this summer. We'll see. Uh, but um, I'd love to hear some more from you. I'm going to read a few of the answers here uh, that we've gotten already from uh, uh, the Thorns. Okay. Uh, Kelly said she loved her most recent activity where she facilitated an eight-week women's group on Thursday evenings in January and February, February called the New Year, New You. So I think that's from Kelly uh, Polson Grill. Thank you, Kelly. Uh, Joan and Craig enjoyed serving meals at the First Chosen series on Wednesday nights. Great way to get to know people. So here we go. I'll be talking about serving meals in our passage from Acts today. Tangible stuff. Good things. Uh, Sarah said one of her favorite experiences was serving on our church council as the secretary. And thank you, Sarah. You did an awesome job. Appreciate that. Um, oh, Hillary. Uh, I don't know if you've seen that. Hillary and Juan. Hello. They're having a nice aloha time with family in Hawaii. So, wow. They're, on, they're online. Isn't it early there? Isn't it super early there? Okay. Three hours difference? Wow. 6.30. They're on. Hillary responded also and said her favorite experience has been taking youth on mission experiences. So, right, she just dittoed my uh, response there. But anything else? Just shout out a one-liner or something, too. Yeah. I teaching kids church. Teaching kids church. That's awesome. No. And, and Vicki Ann, we could probably use a couple others to get those same awesome experiences, right? Am I right? We could. I didn't prompt her to say that. She said it on her own. But kids' ministry is close to our hearts. And when you can see that light go on, that's a great thing of, of just getting it in the Word. So thank you. So ask Vicki if you want to join her. All right. Blessing motorcycles and praying for motorcyclists at rallies or wherever we find them on the road. Blessing those motorcyclists, Christian... CMA, right? Christian Motorcycle Association, wherever they travel. That's a great niche, isn't it, of people that you can reach. Yep. So. I worked with Tax Aid, which is an organization that prepared tax returns for elderly and low and moderate income people in the community nice. for free. And the look on their face when you finish their return in oh. real time. You couldn't pay me enough to yeah. do that work. Thank you, Bill. If you didn't hear preparing taxes for those in need, elderly, disabled, the folks that just are so appreciative too. And you got a skill set there that you're able to use to bless others, Bill. Is those are treasure, our church council treasurer. So thanks for serving too. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, Marvin. Our church in Cottage Grove served a, a dinner twice a week to the poor. 
Okay. It was a wonderful experience to work with them. Wonderful. When you were in Cottage Grove, served a meal for those in need, the poor that uh, received a meal. Thank you. Yeah. So children's art messages with seniors, so yeah. allowing them to participate in that way, and, and Meals on Wheels was part of that whole connection, so lots of connections. Well, they did the art messages to uh, give to seniors on the Meals on Wheels program oh, on so a the, monthly basis. So the kids did the artwork that they yes. gave to the seniors. Right, and Neat. The messages. Neat. So really, wow, the kids so cared and gave these little gifts to... People, they did along that with their on meal. On a monthly basis for about four or five years. Four or five years, great, great run of, of ministry. Well, I love these, love these examples, and I look out and I see people that have a heart right here. This is this is probably one reason I would guess that you felt compelled to be a part of and can stay a part of a, a of a community because you've had opportunities to use your gifts, your abilities. I've heard that. If people don't get involved in a, in a ministry or connection of serving or, or, or learning or growing something together, uh, they're probably in and maybe out the door. And so that is such a good connection point when we can. And they'll talk with me more. I'd love to hear more. I'll share with the other ways that we can connect. But if you're looking for either a new ministry or just to, plug de- to get plugged into a ministry for the first time, um, or maybe something's changed, you must say, I'd like to serve in a new way. We'd love to talk to you. I know Dana has all kinds of areas I'll highlight in a moment, too, that we can continue to help, so uh, let us know. But serving is such a vital part of the Christian life, and uh, we're looking at uh, Acts chapter 6, and again, I'm putting out that card of Bible, so if you forgot your Bible or would like to look on at any time, don't hesitate, get up and get one. So uh, if you'd like one, we're going to be uh, uh, looking at a shorter passage. You might say, oh, thank goodness. Uh, than last week. <laughs> that was a long one. A lot to digest. So, okay, we only got about uh, uh, seven, eight verses today. Um, uh, but a very important passage. Uh, the good news has been spreading out throughout the first five chapters to throughout Jerusalem, Judea. Soon Philip's going to take the message out to Samaria. And, and uh, this isn't such a, I guess you'd say, dramatic passage as we've seen other ex- instances of miraculous healing or, you know, angels releasing these guys out of prison and all this good stuff but but practical importance serving one another serving god's family serving the church and uh as we look back in a short review of the first five chapters um you might sometimes think wow you know wouldn't it have been great to be in that early church uh wouldn't it have been awesome to be a part of that early church in acts and to see all these amazing things happening and well the answer could be well yes and no. <laughs> um, living life together, people coming to Christ, great. We move in, first couple chapters, Acts 3 and 4, a little bit of conflict, some healing, but, uh, and people are being converted, but then there's prison and persecution these first followers are facing. And uh, Acts 2, we see this community that's sharing everything, and people are coming to faith, thousands, and healing. And Acts 5, we see some almost deceitfulness, um, death, if you remember Ananias and Sapphira, um, there's imprisonment, more persecution, and yes, the Lord was doing great things, but there was, it wasn't easy. And in Acts chapter 6, we see church organizational problems, oh, my favorite thing to see, ah, <laughs> yes, that just warms my heart to see, yeah organization well you know i i thought i know when i was was becoming a pastor back in the mid 90s going to seminary and all of us young guys have this we're going to change the world and church is never going to be like it's ever been before and everything we just listen to us and all our ideas that we've got and and, uh, well there's meetings challenges behind the scenes tasks that people are involved in traditions other good lots of good things to it real life implications people's lives and ah, it's it's life isn't it it's people there's highs there's lows but 
pray for prayerfulness that a center of God's word never it never fails and we remain focused on his promises uh, and we see God moving in the midst of all our human frailness and our human desires God centers us and I think uh, sometimes we see that metaphor of the church as a family right and think about in your family life over the years you know sometimes in families it's like oh it's great we got family night and games and ice cream and pizza and oh and then we're planning this awesome vacation and all that thing. sometimes it's family is just awesome and good things are happening and then okay back down to reality here getting back from you know game night and fun and vacation and there's chores and there's jobs everybody's got to do and people get sick sorry sanders family i heard you're down with flu or something praying for you guys get better b and everyone else uh, or maybe there's a fight among the siblings and uh, somebody steps on a lego and screams and cries and <laughs> whatever those things are uh, appointments are forgotten arguments start uh, so real life stuff and you can say sometimes yeah in the church we gotta we have all kinds of stuff that happens yet in the real life real time of family of church life church family we have real life ways to love and serve one another and seeing beyond any any um, trivial differences which a lot of things are when it gets down to it okay we're centered on Jesus we're centered on the Word of God let's move forward and as we serve the family of God we get to both enjoy and receive God's love and we get to display it we get to demonstrate it right the love of Jesus so like I said prefacing all that with the theme challenges arise in the early church here we go <laughs> Acts 6 1 through 7 in those days, when the number of disciples was increasing, the Grecian, or Hellenistic, the Greek Jews, among them complained because the Hebraic, the Hebrew Jews, because their widows were being overlooked in the daily distribution of food. So the twelve gathered all the disciples together and said, it would not be right for us to neglect the ministry of the word of God in order to wait on tables. Brothers, Choose seven men from among you who are known to be full of the Spirit and wisdom. We will turn this responsibility over to them and will give our attention to prayer in the ministry of the Word. This proposal pleased the whole group. They chose Stephen, a man full of faith and of the Holy Spirit, also Philip, Prochorus, Nicanor, Timon, and Pumbaa. No, that's, that's a little Lion King humor there. Sorry. <laughs> that's where that name came from. Okay, sorry. I digress. Parmenas and Nicholas from Antioch, a convert to Judaism. They presented these men to the apostles who prayed and laid their hands on them. So the word of God spread. The number of disciples in Jerusalem increased rapidly, and a large number of priests became obedient to the faith. So, uh, pause for a moment as we think through these verses and what we've just read. Uh, right away in verse 1, I'm just going to re revisit a few of these verses. Um, there's this complaint among the, uh, it says the, the Grecian Jews, or in some translations say the Hellenistic Jews, meaning Greeks, against the Hebraic Jews, the Hebrew Jews, that their widows are being overlooked. So, uh, here we are. Uh, you think about these meals that were being provided for those in need. Uh, food, widows, church was taking care of these women practically. And uh, it was doing something pretty, pretty strong and almost kind of radical. I mean, it's, but it's the church being the church, right? There's no uh, food stamps or, or social programs to take care of these, these women. Um, to, and there's two different groups. Both at, down to the core are Jewish believers in Christ. But they spoke different languages. You have the Greek speaking and the uh, Hellenistic uh, uh, Jews, and then uh, also those that are more the Hebrew from Jerusalem kind of folks. So, so think about women from other parts of the world moved to Jerusalem after the, maybe after the death of a husband or some other economic hardship. And there's these two uh, groups of women that have different languages, different customs that are 
trying to work things out. Okay, and so again, try hard, but try to imagine a world with tension around people groups of different ethnic backgrounds. Ever, has that ever happened? <laughs> Only here in Acts, right? Doesn't take too long. Okay, yeah, maybe there's some tension in these two different groups of women. So the Hebrew woman may be looking down on the Greeks, and then, you know, somebody messes up the Excel spreadsheets on food distribution, <laughs> okay? Uh, right? No. Whatever they had, something happened. And it says, they didn't just disregard it, it says in verse 2, the 12 summoned the whole company of disciples and said it wouldn't be right for us to give up preaching the word to wait on tables. So, okay, don't take this negatively. Something needed, needed to happen. And they're about to select some very important people to help in this area. It's not that one isn't more important, but what's the calling? Right? Less to do with importance of the work and more to do with gift or calling. Because remember, all people, let me say it again, all people, let me put that up, all people are important to God and to his church. And again, everyone has a high calling to serve and to bless one another in God's family. And that's where they said, we've got to select some men of good reputation, full of the spirit and wisdom, not just who can we get to help these these women that are having this issue. No, There's, these are some solid uh, uh, men that they're going to call to point to this duty. But those apostles, those first apostles said, we're called, our role is this, to, to prayer and to the ministry of the word. We can't be doing all things. We need more people to help in this ministry. So again, as we serve the family of God, enjoy and display the love of Christ. All ministry is important, whether waiting on tables or prayer and ministry of the word and so i I really see that there's some good leadership uh, um, of the first apostles and as they see the need and how they handle that Uh, good leaders right don't do everything perfectly there was something that happened in the church we don't know people were legitimately left feeling left out um, right, no one does anything, everything perfectly, no, only Jesus. But what did they do? Okay, started, okay, we got to work in teams together. And they summoned the whole company of those, those, uh, those leaders in the early church. Uh, teamwork, working together to serve the church the best. And um, I think about, you know, the model of leadership even that we have here at Community of Hope, right? We have a uh, a church council, an elected body of, of men and women that are called to serve and to, and to lead. Um, um, Sarah Bennett spoke up how good it was. She enjoyed serving as the secretary, okay, and did an awesome job. Uh, Bill, you mentioned your gifts and abilities in the secular world that you apply to the, to the uh, church here. It's, it's financial and wisdom and gifts you've been given to help us understand what's going on, how we balance in the book. So thank you, Bill, for being, being treasure. Others have served and continue to serve in various ways uh, of ministry. Um, and, and thank you to all those that, that lead. You can see their pictures. Pray for them. They're on the wall as you go out to the, to the right. Uh, they're on a wall. Uh, just remember to, to pray for our leaders. Uh, providing direction, oversight, hands-on ministry. But it's not only people that we elect for leadership that serve. You've already showed me, as you've even spouted out a few of those answers, how vitally important each ministry is in serving, whether it's the people in need, children, community, right here at church. So working together, that can't just be one person or one small group it's got to be many so working in teams and of course we see a sense of taking responsibility here too and the 12 called everybody together and said hey let's fix let's fix this there's a problem and people like peter even give him some credit here Uh, he could have made a lot of excuses saying guys i can't be involved in this this is above me i mean hey i'm preaching the word Look at what I've been doing. I've been thrown in prison. I've been beaten up. I've healed people with my shadow. Okay? I preach sermons that save thousands. He said, no, he's... Okay, this is important. We've got to fix this. And uh, I love that example of taking responsibility, not making excuses, 
And really, even for things, it wasn't his fault, let's just say. It wasn't their fault. But good leaders take that responsibility, even things that aren't their fault, just pushing it aside. I think about, you know, you see this in different ways in, in life. Um, I'm sorry, I throw in probably too many sports illustrations, but I'm kind of a sports nut, so I like watching football and all that kind of thing, and that's all kind of, you know, over now with the Super Bowl and all that, but I think about, uh, for example, you see interviews of, uh, of teams, and often they'll interview the quarterback, because he's kind of like the leader, right? They look to that guy to get their team to score, and uh, when there's a loss, I think the really solid ones, the mature ones, the ones that get it, you know, say, hey, I'm the first one to take, take this on me. Uh, I could have played better. I'm not blam- you know, they're not blaming their offensive line. They're not blaming the coach, whatever. They're saying, starts with me. I got to play better. And uh, just thinking about that early, those, those examples of taking responsibility that we see right here in the book of Acts, right? And that's a, that's a faithful, good leader. And, and taking responsibility and then addressing in the church, what do we address? Both spiritual and physical needs. You could say there's preaching and there's meal trains, okay? Uh, some, some people have an over-focus on, hey, we just help people. Others say, oh, no, we just preach the word. But it's, it's both. You can't take one from the other. Spiritual, practical, and it's all woven together. It's all for the Lord. Uh, ministry of the word and prayer and bring a meal. <laughs> help people that are in need. And so they choose then, we see, choose the right people for ministry, including Stephen, a man full of faith and the Holy Spirit. That's right there in Acts 6, uh, verse 5. So it says, in, as I read on verses uh, 5 and 6, um, we read this proposal, please the whole company, chose Stephen, again, as I said, man full of faith, and the Holy Spirit, and the, and the others. Um, uh, so they had them stand before the apostles who prayed and laid their hands on them. I love that reminder. They're the right people for the job, filled with the Holy Spirit and faith, and others look to them for care and leadership. And I think about this, this unique subset of, of leadership. Um, all these names, interestingly enough, are non Jewish names. They're believers, kind of like those uh, Hellenistic or Greek women. They're Jewish believers in Jesus. That's the first followers were, the first, first believers were. They're fully Jewish, lived in different parts of the world that came together. Uh, but um, all, not, all these, these men that are chosen are, are non-Jewish names. But think about it. Doesn't it match with who is being overlooked? Oh, so they had the sensitivity these women would probably respond well to people that spoke their language, let's just say. Um, and these same names, Hellenistic Greek names, that's kindness, that's graciousness, that's understanding who would best serve these women in need. And we see some that get some strong notoriety. We're going to be looking at uh, Stephen in the next few weeks. Remember, Stephen was the first to die, first to be martyred on account of his faith in Jesus. And we see that him spoken about clearly in these next, uh, these next weeks. What about Nicanor? Ever heard of him again? Or Timon, Prochorus, Parmenas? Others may be more obscure, but Jesus knows. And these sisters in Christ knew them and, and respected them. We may not know them, but again, Jesus knows. Those women that were helped, they know. And God blessed their efforts. I'm reminded example after example of people that selflessly have served and uh, that nobody really knew. Um, even uh, uh, Billy Graham, I think, gave an account of a man that was a Sunday school teacher that was just basically explain the gospel to him as a as a child and he never forgot the seeds that that man planted that came to fruition in the years that followed but just to get back to vicky ann's example of a heart for jesus and teaching kids and 
Look at what that seed do. Man probably never knew. Won't knew this side of heaven. Never knew <laughs> as he passed away. So we see. What's the result of this in verse 7? We see that the word of God spread. The word of God spread. Disciples in Jerusalem increased greatly in number. Large group of priests became obedient to the faith. So more and more of this Jewish community is around them is coming to faith. As we look to Jesus, we see him as our faithful leader, and we see that we are called to follow his example. You could say that Jesus is our lead deacon, elder, council member, council president, senior pastor, right? He's our lead servant. Think those two words go together? Absolutely. Leader, servant, leader. Um, if you remember uh, back in Matthew chapter 20, uh, James and John's mother came to Jesus. And she was asking him, hey, Jesus, could you put my boys at your right and left? You know, just do me a little, do me a solid, do me a favor here. <laughs> asking for this prominent place in the messianic cabinet of royalty. <laughs> and Jesus said, oh, yeah, hey, We'll work that out. Yeah, sure. No, he said this, this timeless passage from Matthew 20, 28. The Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve, and to give his life as a ransom for many. Put everything in its proper perspective. Yes, Jesus is a king, but he's a very clear, certain kind of king. And let's look at who Jesus is. Who is Jesus our king? What does he do? He's a, Jesus is our king who washes feet, rides a donkey, and dies on a cross. And this king is risen, ascended, ruling, and reigning. Isn't it? Even as we spoke clearly in those words in the creed just a few moments ago. And he is still serving us today. This is Jesus. Again, our lead pastor calling us asking us, asking you, how is God calling you to serve? I've highlighted it already, many ministry opportunities. If you have any questions, talk with Dana, look at the clipboard in the back that just starts a, a short list of, of Sunday foot things that we focused on, but there's so many more areas. Ask Vicki Ann or other Sunday school teachers about, about teaching or all those kind of things. We, we need God's people to continue to rise up and, and, and meet needs both within as well as those that are serving outside of these doors. We've got, we highlighted food for thought and ministries going not just inward, but it's going out to others around us in our community. One that I know that no one, none of you mentioned, but I know that's close to many of your hearts is that service to less kids with royal family uh, the Royal Family Kids uh, Ministry, many of you have been a part of, and just, again, ways that hearts serve, and you get, I know, are blessed in return when you serve these kids that come from foster homes and get a summer camp week that they never forget. Who is God calling you to serve? And I hope it starts right at home, even as you're driving home at the end of the day, whatever your day brings, work, family life, uh, et cetera, et cetera, if, you got, if you're going home and you've got people home with you, it all, it's all you're thinking about, oh, I'm going to get a good meal and put my feet up, or you think about it, I'm, I'm coming home. I'm here to serve my family. I'm here to serve my children, my spouse, those around me, whether we're young or old. How do we have that servant's heart when it gets down to just real life stuff? And I think it, it comes home more and more when we realize Jesus is constantly serving you and me. You know, uh, think of the worship service. Who's doing, who's doing the serving? Is it the staff and other leaders serving you? Uh, no, we're, we're serving the Lord, and the Lord is here serving us. And we won't celebrate communion today. We'll be doing that next week. But I think about, again, how we receive from the Lord himself, right? When we receive communion and when we come together to receive Jesus in that holy way. So if we want to serve... Again, remember, I must first receive Jesus and the service he brings to me and to my heart. He has come to us first in love.
to uh, this world that's broken and that's dying, to our lives as broken sinners. He's come to you and to me and had given us everything, right? That king, remember that we've just said, who died on a cross, who rose, who's ascended, who's coming again. And Lord, our prayer would be make us servants. As we remember first and receive first that promise of how, Jesus, you have served us first in love. And we receive that, receive that gift of life. Though our sins have broken this relationship, God, you promised to heal and restore, to forgive and renew. Lord, we receive you in that promise. Help us follow in faith and to serve as you have first served us in the world that, that uh, you so loved, that you gave everything for. Amen. As I think of these questions, I encourage you to take them to heart this week. How does our service of each other flow out of the way that Jesus serves us? What does it mean that Jesus is the leader of our church? What fears, hurts, sins keep you from serving others fully, if you're honest and you take inventory? How is Jesus inviting you to lay aside those things that you can both give and receive, Christ-like service? If we truly served one another in the church, how would that help our evangelistic witness to a watching world? I hope that edge is never just satisfied and we're good, right? Is there always something? What's God doing new? What's God stirring in us that would be a witness as we serve our community and our world?